I'm Alan Perkins, I'm Head of Programme for Complex Infrastructure, which is one of the three programmes within our, our major projects, Capital Business Division. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is the journey we've been on. So uh, a bit of an introduction and a context to Highways England, um, a bit about major projects uh, and complex infrastructure where I sit. Uh, and then the bit that's really important is um, we, we started our project data analytics journey on the A14. I'm going to share some uh, our learning from there. We've taken that learning from the A14 uh, and built what we've called our Chrysalis data platform, which is in use across the whole uh, complex infrastructure program. And then um, the, as Highways England and major projects now, uh, we've actually got a, a digital by default change and, change and transformation plan, which is looking to roll these tool sets out across all the projects within um, Highways England. So it's, it's a real journey from one project to programs and then to to all of our projects. And then um, I've, I've, I've got some asks of you at the end, uh, and then there'll be some time for some Q&A. Um, and also I've got um, Ian Gordon supporting me, who's our Head of Data Architecture and Engineering, uh, who's supported me from an IT perspective. So if you get any deep technical questions, Ian can answer them, and, and I can answer the business-related questions. Yeah, bring it on, that's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I my my journey is yeah I, I'm a a pro, program manager project director so my journey in data analytics has been all around how do we use this to better deliver projects. There was a simple short video about Highways England so you just get a bit of context. At Highways England, we believe in a connected country. We believe that connecting people builds communities, that connecting families with places creates memories, that connecting workers with jobs creates opportunities, and that connecting businesses helps our nation thrive. Our network makes these connections happen, four million a day, and we make them happen safely, reliably, because we're the ones who never sleep. The ones who strive to improve our major roads and motorways. The ones who quietly design and plan, build and run. With pride, care and experience. Because our network is vital to the running of the country. We engineer the future to keep people moving today and moving better tomorrow. We've introduced Cockneys to Cornwall and Carlisle to the continent. 4,300 miles driven smarter and smoother. City to countryside, mountain to coast, wherever the people are. What connects them is England. What connects England is us. So that just gives you a, a bit of context about what's Highways England uh, responsible for. Yeah, it's 4,300 miles of uh, motorway and A road uh, across the country. Um, we're, we were set up in um, 2015, so we're, we're a, a government-owned, publicly funded company. Uh, our shareholder is the Department for Transport, uh, and I and I actually joined. Uh, I joined Highways England's predecessor for three weeks in uh, March 2015. So I've been I've been involved in Highways England uh, right right from the beginning. Um, um, to give you a feel for how how big Highways England is and how much the network is used, yeah, there are 95 billion miles travelled on uh, the strategic road network every year. 34% uh, of the country's traffic is carried on on our network, and 68% of the country's freight traffic is carried on the strategic road network. So it, it's uh, it's a big company. And it's got a lot of responsibility, and it's core to particularly moving freight around the country. Um, we're funded, one of the big differences in creating Highways England was um, it's funded on a five year cycle now, and they're called road investment periods. So the first uh, road investment period was 2015 to 2020, uh, and we were given 15 billion pounds to spend on 
operating, maintaining and improving the network. Uh, and we delivered that um, at the end of the uh, 2020. We had spent the uh, 15 billion and delivered the projects we'd committed to government. So the result of our success in, in the first five years led to us uh, a deal for the next five years that went up from uh, 15 billion um, to 27.4 billion. So um, the government and Department of Transport have seen the good work that we've done um, in the first five years. Uh, they want us to continue that in the next five years. And uh, we're just starting year two of that um, second five year period. Uh, and the um, 27 billion is split down as per the diagram. The bit I am involved in is the what's called the enhancement schemes, the 14.2 billion. Um, and that's that's where major projects where I sit uh, and major projects is split into three um, uh, programs. So you've got the regional investment program, which is a, a bunch of capital um, delivery projects all around the, the country that split north and south. You've got the smart motorways program, which is all around increasing the capacity on the motorway network and complex infrastructure where I set, sit, well, we built the program and the team to build, create Highways England's capability to do these big complex projects. So um, when I when I started in 2015, we had two projects, which was A14 Cambridge to Huntingdon uh, and Lower Thames Crossing, uh, one at one and a half billion and one at circa six billion. Uh, since then, we've we've gained two more projects, and we've got some more in the pipeline. So, what I want to talk about is the the data journey we've been on um, within uh, complex infrastructure. So, uh, we started on the A14. So, the A14, when I joined in 2015, uh, was just going through its um, planning process, uh, and then it started work the year after. Uh, give you a, a, a feel for the scale of the A14. Uh, it's a 1.5 billion pound project, um, delivers, you know, it's got a great um, benefits ratio, it's delivering 2.5 billion uh, benefits to the economy. But, and we delivered that we opened for traffic eight months early in May last year against our uh, baseline date of December 20. Uh, and part of that, Part of the reasons for the su success of the project was how we used the data to uh, drive decision making during that period. And I'll come on to show you exactly how we did that. So just in terms of some of the data we gathered, you know, uh, currently we've worked um, close on 15 million man hours. Uh, we've had two Riddors, which are serious accidents in in that period, we're we're getting close to the end of the project. We're we spent 1.4 billion out of the um, 1.5 billion budget. Um, we've inducted 15,000 people that have worked on the project uh, over the life cycle of the four-year construction, uh, and we peaked in May 19, where we had two 2,800 people working on the project. Um, every day and we were spending two million pounds a day. So having data that told us that uh, what happened yesterday and making decisions on what do we need to do today was vital in um, helping us deliver early. And it, and it was all done by a, a, a Power BI based uh, project reporting platform we created. Uh, and it's created with with our supply chain. So whether you were um, Costain, Scanster, Balfour BT, our designers or Highways England, we are all looking at the same data on, on a daily basis. And and this this is a sample of the um, top level uh, management data we looked at. Um, so High Highways England has three imperatives. Uh, their safety, customer and delivery. Um, so if you look at the um, 
safety work, safety sort of um, tiles. These are the, the key metrics we were measuring on a daily basis, things like accident frequency rate, um, number of accidents, um, number of hours since the last serious accident, and the tiles, the, the little worms on the tiles show you the trend over a period of time. So you can see whether that trend is getting um, better or worse. And uh, when we first started using this in, in the sort of uh, uh, management meetings, we were printing that, this out as a PDF and giving it to people. Uh, and we were conducting a meeting based on a PDF. And then you're going, well, that, that tile's red. How, how do we dive into the detail? Um, uh, and all that detail was available in the system. So what we did, what we soon realised was the best way to conduct the um, uh, the monthly progress performance meetings was give everybody an iPad, um, and you're sitting that you're sitting there with the li this live dashboard in, in front of you, and then if you want to drill down into the detail of um, any of those tiles, you can do, and it became much more powerful then when we, we were looking at the data in a live environment rather than looking at it as a PDF, because then we were drilling down into the things that were of concerning to us uh, live and getting to uh, some of the root causes. So this was just a real, a real example of the sort of one of the high level dashboards we created. Um, then beneath each of those uh, key topic areas, so I, I talked about um, health and safety being a, a key key priority for us um yeah that you can see the trend on a monthly basis of the um uh, different types of accident reporting uh, what they were um and again um yeah lo lots of lots of different um trend indicators on on the bottom of the graph some of bottom of this report some of them are yeah things that are what I call lagging indicators, i.e. accidents that have happened, but some of the things that were more lead indicators were, you know, how many people we've done a site induction for, what was the um, percentage pass rate of that site, site induction, yeah, um, we, we rolled out a number of specific training courses, um, particularly around injury-free environments or black hat training, and again, which for me are more um, lead indicators. So this was an example, again, just examples of the data journey we had on, on the A14 and some of the sort of reporting we used on a monthly basis. Second area of focus was customer, uh, and customer for us is both um, road users and um, uh, local, neighbor, local, local communities and neighbourhoods that are affected by our works. Uh, and one of the most um, powerful charts was the um, the bottom right 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 hand um, one, where we're looking at where people have written in to contact us, mapping the postcode of where they um, uh, where their their address was to the, to the areas of the work on the the project, uh, and we got so quite sophisticated to this that says actually you know we could see clusters of um, customer complaints or customer feedback after we'd done uh, particular activities in particular areas of the project. And, and actually then we would target proactive communications that says, we're gonna be working on a, a roundabout at Bar Hill over the next two weekends. How do we then uh, proactively communicate that to the, the people in that neighborhood? And we got very good at using um, social media such as Facebook to uh, as well as traditional methods like uh, leaflet drops. So we used the, the data from a, a, a reactive what 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 were customers complaining about to a, a a proactive. Well, we know we're doing work in that area. Um, how do we communicate with people beforehand so there are no surprises? So it's just another example of how we've used the data we gathered. Uh, another A14 based example is, so we I talked about safety and customer, obviously uh, key to delivering these um, 
the major projects is resource. So again, uh, we we track the um, the resource. Yeah, both things like um, apprentices, um, trainees, graduates, number of hours we're putting into STEM projects. Yeah, uh, against against the um, different companies involved in the um, project. Wh where did they come from? So as you can see, this this data. Yeah, you know, you've got Balfour BT, Costain, Skanska, Highways England, but we're all looking at the same data set. Uh, about what's going on. There, there was no um, hidden data. It, it was a single source of the truth for, for all um, people working on the project. So I talked about safety customer. And one of the things that I think made a real difference to the A14 and our ability to deliver it uh, early and within budget was some of the production controls we put in, in place. And the the this this chart is again just an example. So th this takes um, key key trades working on the project. So earthworks, drainage, structural concrete, pavement, and effectively plotted what was our planned activity. So that was the black line. Um, it then plotted the uh, our actual activity, and then it. The clever bit, it then predicted about on um, current rates, um, how do we get, would we ever get back to the planned level or would we um, always be behind that, behind the curve? And, and what we were able to do, um, and this was particularly useful to the supervisors at, at, and the works managers out on the ground was, so if you um, take drainage, for example, we'd got the project split into five sections you could drill this data down to the individual sections and you could see on a daily basis, for example, section four is um, ahead of its planned activity in drainage, uh, but section five's lagging behind. OK, what we can do tomorrow is move a gang from section four to section five. Uh, and you know, those decisions, yeah, particularly when you're spending two million pounds a day, are hugely valuable from a uh, a productivity and this is for allowing that yeah the, the works managers and the section supervisors to make decisions based on data that we captured about what happened yesterday so it was one of the key sort of um success factors from an a14 perspective so that that just gives you a a flavor of how we use project data to create management insight and then uh, make decisions about how we ran the project. Um, once we'd once we'd done that and we'd got that working over, uh, which was a journey over the uh, the probably the first 18 months of the project, we, we then we then went once one step further. And given that health, safety and well-being was our, our top priority, we we set ourselves the challenge. Could we use um, uh, and this was uh, uh, with our partners, uh, Avenard, that we worked with at the time. Can, can we can we use AI to forecast the increased risk of harm um, for any given day of activity on site? So can we can we predict from today what's likely to happen tomorrow? And what we, what we did is we took a number of um, data sources from within the project. Things like um, incidents, yeah. observations, the schedule, um, people's working hours, the calendar. Um, we also took some external factors into the the, the thinking. So we, we pulled in um, the weather, and, and also we pulled in um, <coughs> of sporting events, both from a, a local perspective and a national perspective, because we had a a potential inkling that if there was a you know, it was a large England football match on the previous night, people might have been um, uh, distracted by that uh, and not fully focused at work the next day. So uh, we we took those data sources. One of the key key things with this is you need 
for the um, data science bit to work well is you need a reliable frequent data over a good period of model and I think when we started we probably had a two years worth of data and as we went through as we added more data on a monthly basis the um, the um, predictability of the tool got better and better so it, it was only something we were able to do because the A14 was in construction for four years and we had a large data set that enables the um, data science to be applied to it. So, so we learned some really valuable lessons out of this. Um, first one, so what this this graph shows you is the um, the, the, the blue sort of squiggly line is the um, number of minor incidents over a period of time. So as you can see, as it went from um, 2017 to uh, 2019, the number of uh, minor incidents uh, reduced. Um, and what the bars do is show the, so we prided ourselves on making sure we got safety observations back from people working uh, out in the field. And we did that by creating an app so that people could, uh, you know, easily feed back what they'd seen, both uh, from a positive and a negative perspective, uh, and give us real time, real feedback. And um, as the at the beginning of the project, the the ratio of negative feedback about things were wrong, things needed to change, were, was obviously, um, yeah, it's probably two and a half to one of negative feedback to um, positive at the beginning. But over the period of us driving the, the safety agenda and the culture um, we and improving the way we worked, we drove the, the observations down to actually towards the end, um, there were more positive observations than negatives. Uh, and lo and behold, if you create a culture where you've got positive observations, you get a reduced number of accidents. So uh, that was really good to see that prove from a, a use of the data perspective. What what did we find out? Um, key things that affected the uh, probability of a, a, an incident the next day. Um, number one was one of the, the key factor was how many of our people were working more than a nine hour shift the previous day. Uh, and that's particularly, it's not just um, the, the, the met the time they, they're, they're doing their physical task, but that also includes traveling to a, to and from the site. Yeah, another another causal factor was how many people had worked late the previous night. Um, so there was some really thing. The model showed this as some really interesting things that we could start to then address to to improve the health and safety culture. Um, and as we as I said, we 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 added more and more data to this on a monthly basis and. We got to a stage where, where the model was um, pretty well 95% plus accurate at predicting uh, the ri higher risk of harm the next day, which we then used to um, influence our start shift briefings, etc., to um, give people um, more information to plan their work the next day. Um, yeah, work, working more, more hours is more influential than the weather. And interesting, of all the trades working for us uh, across, across the A14, the, the group of people that were most likely to do themselves harm were, were archaeologists. Uh, we had, at, at times, I think we peaked at something like 200, 250 archaeologists um, working on the project. And typically, we found that most of those weren't used to working in a construction environment. They weren't used to, um, a lot of them were students. They just weren't used to that environment. So we did things like um, uh, daily warm ups of stretching exercises for the archaeologists, such that we, we ended up with less bad, back, bad backs and um, uh, less, uh, and we got <laughs> professional wheelbarrow people to carry, push the wheelbarrows around for them, because again, they weren't used to doing that uh, all day. But this was all from having the data that showed us w where the uh, 
likely problems are occurring and then we could do something proactively ab about it. But as it says on point five, you, for these models to work, you do need a, a serious amount of data. Uh, and we had that because, you know, the A14 was a big, massive project that was running for a long period of time. So then we, we took our A14 learning and um, applied it to um, the other projects in the complex infrastructure program. So, yeah, that's the Stonehenge Tunnel project, uh, Lower Thames Crossing, uh, and our A428 uh, Black Cat and Catch and Gibbet scheme. So, Chrysalis was just the name of the, the data platform. We, we, we christened the, we gave it a name. And it, whereas the A14 was um, in construction, uh, so it's in the later phases of a project, we wanted to use that learning to apply to those projects at the time who were in their um, development and design st stage. So, and we wanted to make sure, again, learning from the A14, we took data feeds from both core HE systems and partner systems. So we got a single source of the truth for each project. So we went from doing this singularly on the A14 to doing it across um, four, four projects, all of which are over um, 500 million pounds each per project. So they're all big, large scale projects. Um, one of the key learnings for us is, yeah, these these things don't happen uh, on a an instant basis. Yeah, creating the technology is is the easy bit. But you've got to move the um, project teams from being data aware to being data proficient to where we got to on the end on the A14 was being data savvy and, and data driven. But it is a journey and it takes time to, to to get people's mindsets into that. And the other the other the triangle is trying to show that um, we created a pyramid of data that could be used at the the lowest level of granularity, like um, we've got a bunch of licenses for a bunch of tools. How many people are using them? Um, uh, and we could use that to target some of the embedment work through to uh, data used by the project managers at a work stream level, through to the project exec, right through to the project committee. But it's effectively, if the project committee is looking at things like um, start a works date and open for traffic date, you can drill right down to the granular level that you need to. So, the, the Chrysalis um, data platform that we've built and we've, I say we've rolled out on those four projects. Um, we, we like to describe, I describe it as a Rubik's Cube because this is a, a sort of analogy that works for me. So it, it, it takes in things that people were doing on spreadsheets before. It takes in direct data feeds from um, HE core project control systems. So we use Exactium for risk, we use Prism for cost management, we use CMAR for um, contract management, we use Oracle uh, Primavera P6 for scheduling. So stan standard industry-wide tools. Um, we, we took some data, we fit, pulled some data like weather in, into it, and, and that's enabled us to create, you know, some tools and some applications and some libraries. And once the data is in the cube, the project teams can manipulate that data to um, create whatever reports they require. We, we mandate from a, a program perspective, you know, the 80% of reports that we use for sort of upwards reporting, but um, we allow the projects to spin the cube and spin their data however they want to. Still got some builds on this slide. So yeah, we, we take data in on the left hand side, we expose it in tools which are yeah, dashboards and search tools, which I'll talk about in a minute. We've got this hooked up to apps such as uh, the health and safety observation app. Uh, we also had on the A14 uh, a, a productivity app that allowed us to get feedback from people working out and uh, on the ground. 
and we also feed this into the program library. So if you're the if if you're the project manager, if you're if you're the project team, what what does our crystallist data platform do for you? It enables you to increase the efficiencies. It means you're um, taking data to create knowledge and therefore drive action. So it's it's a uh, trying to get people away from the the culture of um, everything being on their own spreadsheet to all being in a, a central data warehouse where anybody on the project, whether they're Highways England or our supply chain partners, can see that um, data. So what I'm going to show you now is some examples of uh, some of the data. So as I said before, the A14 start of our journey was all about the construction phase of projects. Um, the the other projects, Stonehenge and um, Lower Thames Crossing and A428, are in their development phase. So there are different things that we need to track from a productivity perspective. So the the process that Highways England goes through to get planning permission it is called the Development Consent Order, and it's a it's a massive set of documents we have to submit to the planning inspectorate. Um, there are thousands of volumes and thousands of different chapters. So we, we created a tracker that said, uh, yeah, are we on track to produce the documents to work for our DCO application? And we could then drill down to say, actually, no, the environmental work stream is, is running behind. We need to take corrective action there. So that's the sort of top left example. Uh, top right example. Again, one of the things I used to get frustrated at as being the head of program, I'd sit in a, a project progress meeting and we'd get, oh, we're, we're, we're behind on our activity this week because we haven't got access to Farmers Field X to do a, a ground investigation survey. And that, so again, we created top right hand one, plots out all the fields, uh, plots out the um, the, the detail of access to those and where it is in the process. Have we got a design? Have we got a, an agreement with the land there? So again, it allows us to make database decisions other than you're sitting in a meeting and everybody's blaming each other. The the, the bottom left gives just gives you an example of the high level dashboard really at a, you know, at a project director level that they would look at and how they could drill down to it. And the, the right hand one is just an example of um, um, our risk dashboard uh, uh, and our you know, risk exposure, escalated risk. But these are all drill downable live ones. So you can, if you see something going wrong, you can drill down to what's the root cause. So our Chrysalis data platform isn't just about um, dashboards. Because it's uh, effectively an Azure-based um, capability. One of the other things, um, uh, and a good example. So I talked about um, development consent order planning. There are when we did the A14 DCO, there were 28 volumes that we submitted, and what we started at is looking. If you're a member of public and you want to, we've put our documents out for consultation. How do you search all those documents for where do you live or keywords such as air quality or environment, etc. So we used, um, we created a, a, a search tool that enabled us to ingest all those um, PDF documents and, and members of the public from a consultation perspective can then search through, you know, for keywords, but it's helped us from a project delivery perspective really home in on um, making sure we're consistent or actually I'm currently the project director for the A14 we're in the process of sort of handing back land to farmers we can drill down into individual plot level what did we say we were going to do in our development consent order and have we done it so it's given us we've used the uh, Chrysalis um, data platform to do more more than just dashboarding. So then the journey comes. So 
journey started in the A14. We learned from that. We then applied it across the um, the four big projects in the SIP program. Um, and the major projects now is is is, is created um, a transformation in initiative that's aligned to road period two. So it's about, um, as I said at the beginning, we've got 25 billion to uh, deliver projects in the next five years, but effectively we've got pretty close to a flat headcount. So how to become more efficient at delivering um, capital projects? So major projects, so that's you know, both the regional investment program, smart motorways program and complex infrastructure. And now looking at how do we, how do, for all of our projects, how to become a, a digitally enabled data driven major projects delivery organization. Yeah. How do, how do we, from a mindset perspective, how do we go from transforming the way we use data in our projects? Uh, and I'm sure from some of my PMO colleagues on the call, you know, typically we used to spend 80% of the month producing the, 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 the monthly reports uh, and 20% of the time analyzing what's it say and what do we need to do about it? And it's really, how do you, how do you use tools and technology to actually, um, you automate the production of all the reporting and then you spend 80% of your time say, saying, all oh, right, what are the actions we need to take on the data that we've got? So we've just kicked this off. We've we've literally got a funding approval from our investment decision committee today. And it's really around, so mindset is around um, getting that sort of um, the headspace right and our future requirements. Skill set is how do, how do we uplift the capability of our people to um, use data in their day to day decision making. Yeah, I'm really proud to say that I've got five of my team spread across the, the four projects and, and the SIP program doing doing the um, project data analytics apprenticeship with, with Martin. And I know the feedback from those from the, my team is, yeah, working with others on solving common problems has been really useful. So we're looking to drive up the digital capability of the, the High Wiz England teams uh, and particularly yeah, some of my project PMO project controls people. And then from a tool set perspective, we're looking to take the, the, the learning we've had from the A14 and the Chrysalis data platform to uh, really sort of um, drive that across all of um, major projects. We've done that by the, in, the, in, in a standard way of a sort of a, uh, uh, an IT program. You know, we, we've created personas, we've looked at use cases, uh, we've taken the um, existing solutions. So I had uh, Chrysalis is the, the, the SIP data platform I talked about. There was a similar initiative in smart motorways and we have another initiative called smart um, rapid engineering model. So it's about how do we leverage that across all, all projects. So uh, we're now doing a, just doing a pilot, um, just started a pilot of the Chrysalis data pl platform to eight of our regional projects. And you'll be pleased to know I'm getting near the end. I'm gonna go a couple more slides. Um, so what are we trying to get out of this? Yeah, data accuracy and governance, managing performance, improving our digital capability, uh, one thing that's really key, and it echoes what Martin, one of Martin's questions earlier, is collaboration with the supply chain. You know, High Wiz England cannot do this uh, ourselves. Um, probably 20% of the data is High Wiz England data, and 80% of the data is um, um, supply chain data. So, how do, how do we, how does High Wiz England cre create a set of standards where uh, our supply chain can? innovate and then feed data into us and, and ultimately it's about how do we use the data we collect during the project delivery phase to to enable us to um, better manage our assets so in sort of conclusion what what, what have i what have i learned what are the what are the four things that i think 
if you're going to roll it, if you're going to uh, get into data analytics and you're going to get it into your projects and you're going to use it on a day by day basis. Yeah. And as I've shown, yeah, there are real benefits in doing that, you know, particularly in big construction projects. The four key points from it, leadership behavior, um, the success of why we we went on this journey on the A14 was down to the, the project directors saying, um, when we first started putting the data in Power BI and sharing sharing this, people are saying, right, the data's wrong, that's not my data. Um, the, the leadership team were, the, that, that's the data in the system. If you think it's wrong, don't give me a spreadsheet, go and fix the system. Um, uh, fix your data in, in your system. Uh, and it take takes a while, but you've got to you've got to you've got to have that top down leadership support to say, no, no, we've invested in these tools. If the data is wrong in the tools, the tool is not wrong. Fix the data. So I think that that's you've got to get that leadership behavior right. Um, it's a journey. Yeah, one of uh, on the A14, we we, we learn and develop this on a monthly basis. Uh, at the Chrysalis platform we've rolled out across the, the complex infrastructure program, where we get feedback on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and it's about, um, it's better to deploy something that's 80% accurate and get people's feedback from it and then tweak it, rather than do endless rounds of UAT and um, wait till you get it 100% perfect, because then when you deploy it, people will still want changes. So um, it's a journey. You won't get it right first time. Um, never be afraid to fail. You know, we've tried lots of things. We've 80% of the time they've probably worked. But um, uh, one of the things I've learned from this journey is never be afraid to fail. Not all of my proof of concepts and ideas have worked, but the majority have. And, and, and really important, um, I don't have all the good ideas. It's the people delivering the project. It's my... Uh, risk leads, it's my project managers, it's my system project managers, it's the design leads, it's it's the people from a day-to-day -day perspective who have all the great ideas about, well actually I'm spending hours doing this stuff by spreadsheets, wouldn't it be good if? So if you take nothing else away, they are for me are the key, my key learnings from a, um, a delivery perspective is yeah, rolling out the technology is the relatively easy bit. You've, you've got to get these bits right. And, and just, yeah, finally, uh, what, what am I asked of you, you, everybody listening? Um, I think there's some real opportunities to share and work together here. You know, I'm pleased to be part of the um, Project Data Analytics community. Yeah, I with England can't solve this as uh, our own, but if we work together, with both the asset owners and the um, supply chain. I think there's there's some real areas we can make a difference. Um, and for me, some of the obvious common areas are health, safety and well-being and productivity, because they're, they're, they're common to all of us. So enough, enough, enough of me talking. Absolutely superb. Thank you, Alan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I hope, um, hopefully that's, that's a, I, I'm not. I'm not. Not by. By didn't particularly a technologist. I do have a. I did have an IT background many years ago. But for me, it's about as a project director, how can I use data to better deliver my projects? Yeah. So uh, we've got quite a lot of uh, comments from people. So where I'd like to start from is um, if I could just throw one in just to get the ball rolling, and then I'll start to work through lots of other people's comments is in terms of your approach it's very much looking at the project and then using that to forecast performance what will you do in terms of the use of a14 data so you can roll that forward to look at various metrics and to start to forecast on your next job so a lot more than reference class forecasting it's more individual forensic insights what are you going to do to leverage all of that yeah really good question am i and so we're, we're currently so the, the A14 project, although it's open for traffic, is still uh, doesn't finish its final set of works till um, end of this year, earlier next. But I'm actively harvesting all the data from the A14 project and putting it in our 
Chrysalis data platform so that we've got all that um, knowledge and history to, to start doing what you described. So we're in the harvesting all that data so I don't lose it when the project closes down. Um, so now then thinking about how do we do that predictive based on the data we've gathered. Cool, that's brilliant. Um, and if you want to throw some of that into the construction data trust, Alan, and then um, uh, potentially chuck some of it into the hackathons as well. You know, we can solve some big problems with you um, and bring the community in and get them all involved. And yeah, maybe uh, throw a bit of GPT-3 at it as well. <laughs> whatever that may be. Um, yeah, and the huge learning for me was, you know, um, we, 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 we spent four or five years delivering the A14 digitally. Um, yeah, there's still opportunities in the way we hand over the assets to our operational colleagues and to Cambridge County Council, where we're still um, translating da data back to 2D to do that handover. And nobody ever, nobody ever thought about this requirement to archive all the data and how valuable it is. So I, I, I'm really driving that change at the minute. Yeah, cool. Yeah, fantastic. So the first question came in at 1918 from Laurie Marshall. So one of your slides had got activity count. So I think it's your S curve had got activity count instead of earned value. Can you explain that? Yeah, I'll try to explain that. So it's, um, as I said, one of the things we did was get data back from the field about activities that were done the previous day. So um, we, we used to do sort of um, weekly or two weekly look ahead collaborative planning and that would have a set of activities that were planned to be done for the next week or stuff. And it was it was based on the, the feedback from that that we use the data. I think if you take earn value into it, you're adding another layer of interpretation um whereas what we were just trying to do is have we have, have we done the activities we said we were going to do yeah so i think we just tried to keep it simple uh, at the time we did it cool that's great thank you a question from deepak so it says have you applied machine learning to the data to improve lead indicators no uh, as a, we're about to. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I've got a project running in a minute to harvest all that A14 data and to put it into our Chrysalis data platform, uh, and then yeah, we'll we'll think about how do we how do we um, apply machine learning to some of that data. Okay. Um, so a question from uh, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Ila, is it Ilse? I don't know. I'm dreadful at those sort of names. Um, were the A14 project dashboard requirements sought as part of the project tender and procurement phases? No, no. The, this was very much a, a a journey we went on as a um, joint delivery team saying, yeah, this is the biggest project in Highways England. We need to um, work together to deliver it in the most efficient way and uh, the leadership team bought into that we need us we need to maybe be making decisions on a single source of the truth um and it evolved over a period of time i think we are looking to specify that much more in future contracts so it, we're currently procuring the um stone Edge tunneling contractor and we've been much more specific about um, data sets and frequency but Yes. No, we didn't do it on the A14. It grew organically through the life cycle. And is that going to change? So as a major client with 25 billion to spend, are you going to start to drive the industry to make them more data driven? Is this going to be part of your attended documents in the future? Are you going to be asking for this? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, as part of the, the major project digital by default change program, um, we're, we've got a supply chain engagement forum at various levels. And we are looking to um, write this into future contracts. Right, cool. Yeah, it's great to see that actually. I would like to see that right across the board because, you know, that will drive this transformational change that we're trying to push forward through the community. So yep. fantastic. I think that's real leadership. Thank you. Uh, um, and, and our view is 
I, I'm not about specifying how my supply chain do things. I am about specifying this is the data feeds and the data sets and the uh, frequency of those datas that we all need to set and view on a daily, weekly, monthly basis so we can ses successfully deliver. Yeah, cool. Yeah, fantastic. I think it's about lifting the fog as well. I see a lot of project delivery professionals who's just flying in fog. To, they can't see quite what's going on. They don't trust it. And it sounds like you've um, solved some of those issues. So that's brilliant. Well done. Yeah, and I, I think, it, as I said, it's the leadership behaviour is as much, as much an important factor as the um, solving the technology of getting the systems to talk together to put it in the day warehouse. Yeah, cool. Uh, there's a question probably not entirely fair for you. I think it's more for your wingman, Ian. You there, Ian? Question coming. So uh, in terms of the data model for, I think this is for the safety analysis. So what kind of model was it? And what's the most challenging aspect of building it? Wow, OK. Uh, I wasn't actually involved in that part, Alan. I'm assuming it was a regression analysis that, um, that Altius did. Um, but I, 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 I wouldn't wouldn't know for sure. I think one of the Altius guys is on the call. Um, I think you'll find Lewis is hiding on the call who will know the yeah, answer. Yeah, exactly. I, I spotted his name. I thought, well, that might be useful. So, Lewis, if you're there, if you want to come off mute. Oh, that's a little unfair because I wasn't specifically involved in that piece of work, but. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know more than I do, though, Lewis. Uh, but, Look, yeah, Lewis, that's Steve here as well. I'm on the call if you want me yeah, to pick Steve it up. Yeah, Steve might be able to be a little bit uh, closer to the work. Um, yeah, I mean, I won't go into too much detail. Uh, the, the, um, the, the challenge with the model was because we were looking at project days, um, e even even after even after a year and a half on, on vehicle team project working, you only have 400 observations, um, but you do have a very wide data set with lots of attributes based on schedule, observations, weather, all the, all the things that Alan talks about. Um, the, the, the key algorithm was an XG boost algorithm. Um, but um, it's probably worth a different topic, but we basically built um, a, a, a very wide range, a set of models on the same day to basically use XGBoost to pick the best model um, against that data. So it was a fairly technical approach, um, but, but XGBoost is the key algorithm that, that, that drove the model. Cool. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I'll speak to you soon as well, Steve. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, our next question is from Deepak. Um, He's saying, have you considered other applications of machine learning beyond safety data, for example, to improve confidence in achieving key project and program milestones? I, I think we're, that's the stage we're at now. Is, right. is um, so, so the digital by default program is trying to do two things. It's about getting a standard level of digital tools across the whole of major projects based on some of the learning I, I shared earlier. But in parallel that, it's developing new features and capability. And some of the stuff Stephen and Ian and I are talking about is how do we, where, where, else, where, where else have we got a sufficiently big data set that machine learning could add value? Cool. Yeah, you'll, uh, you'll find that the big data sets are pretty, they're not the most common things in our industry, are they, Alan? So, no. You know. what, what, what are the I benefits? This is of, where, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, one of the benefits of the, using the complex infrastructure projects is typically they're out on the ground in construction for four years. So it gives us that big data set. Some of the uh, smaller regional investment programs are perhaps only 18 months, two years. So you get a much smaller data set. Yeah. There's a question from Anne Marie, and she's been a supporter of the community right since the start, really. Um, so, you talked about uh, pulling in people like Costain and Balfour's and those sort of people. But what about your mid tiers and, and your smaller companies? Are you getting them involved? And what's the best way for them to get involved in this? Especially if you're going to be start to put some requirements on them in the future. So, what can they do to make sure they're keeping up with the big boys? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think, um, um, again, one of the key success factors of the A14 is um, the data sets we were looking at uh, and pavements, a classic well, pavement drainage 
all those works are done by tier two and tier three contractors. So it, you know, um, it's making sure that the, the so the, 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 the asphalt one was making sure the data fed up from uh, AI aggregate industries who were doing that into, into the, the project um, data warehouse. So I think there is absolutely a, um, for those key um, um, skill set uh, areas that are cr crucial to product performance, we have we need the tier twos on board with their data flowing in the same way. All right, cool. So um, we do some of that through the meetup community as well, you know, and through the hackathons and start to open up to people and just encourage more and more of your supply chain to get involved and we'll hack through it and we'll just open source those solutions and make them available to other uh, sectors as well. That would be really cool. Uh, right, I'll start to rattle through these questions, otherwise we're going to be here all night. Could I draw a close on any more questions coming in, please? Because we've still probably got 15 minutes worth here. I want to try and get finished by quarter past eight if we can. So a good question here is, did the projects encounter any key legal issues or challenges about data-based approaches? No, it, it, interestingly not. I think um, there was certainly some reluctance from the commercial community to 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 share data across the seven or eight companies that were working on the project. Um, but it, again, it was driven by the leadership behaviour, saying that uh, um, we're all incentives. But what success looks like to all of us is delivering this project on time to on budget. Um, and with that mindset, we were able to unlock that um, data sharing. Um, so no, we didn't encounter no legal challenges to that. OK, cool. Thank you. As a question from Robert uh, Bollum, um, how much of your data integrity issues are because of root system uh, configuration problems? Um, no, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but uh, effectively, um, the, the, the data maturity journey we went on was when we first um, started surfacing this data in the management meetings, people say, well, no, no, you've got the wrong, wrong data, you're not looking at the right things. Uh, and we were going, no, no, that's what the system's saying. So it was predominantly around um, getting people to input the right data. It wasn't about beating people up, it was about how do we use the data to um, understand where our problems are and drive performance. Um, I would say 60, 40, 70, 30 is um, quality of the data rather than the, the, the tool set. Um, uh, Vicky, I don't know whether you want to add something to that based on your sort of, you're probably closer to this than me than some of the problems we've seen. Yeah, I think it's kind of what you're saying, isn't it? I think a lot of it is the challenge of getting it right in the source systems that is the biggest challenge uh, and getting people to believe that that is correct um just as you said the challenge then becomes well actually go back and fix it because in excel or whatever it's too easy to just fiddle with a number and fix it so it yeah. looks right but actually going back around that whole loop again and getting people to start from the bottom and at source and then obviously that feeds its way back through is a lot more challenging cool Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Vicky. Uh, question from John Lowe. Uh, so what's your view on data trusts? That's a good one. Love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Um, I think there is a, a, an opportunity for the or industry or multiple industries to, to work together to solve some of these problems quicker. Um, how we do that? I think data data trust has has a part to play. I think um, just based on yeah, um, the previous CIO in Highways England called me a positive disruptor, which I took as a compliment. Um, there's just to get it's taken me five years to to do the journey I described in my slides. So I think um, there's a lot of um, trust, a lot of um, people behavioural issues to, to get over 
to get into the the data trust bit but i do believe it's the right way to go because i think working together we can solve some of these problems quicker yes, uh, there's, a, there's a shocking statistic that says agriculture is more more um has more productivity improvements than construction yeah yeah I think with productivity, you know, we've been taught to be the business, which is like a semi-government initiative through Bayes, all about productivity. Um, and there's Mace and Sir Robert McAlpine, British Land and a few others involved who's trying to drive some of this productivity agenda. So I think we need to be reaching across uh, some of these silos and all, all joining forces to fix these issues. And some of that data is really sensitive, right? It's all about your crown jewels and, and profit and that sort of stuff. So we need to find ways of breaching that. And I think it can all be done through differential privacy and all sorts of solutions. So we'll find a way forward with it. I think it's it's in reach and I think there's increasing sort of appetite to do it, which is cool. Uh, another question from Robert Ballam again. So he's saying, who's the business owner of the Chrysalis platform? And data extracted, a uh, data extraction timing updates etc. Um, effectively, it's me as the head of program, uh, and uh, I have both a, a digital team um, and I have a PMO team. So the PMA PMO team run the um, timing, the schedule. The digital team run the tool set. But it's cool. it's me. Cool. Thank you. A question from Tommy Clark, a great presentation, and you've got a lot of love, by the way. There's uh, loads of, of comments on there about thank you, great presentation, so I shan't read all those out, but uh, a lot of love, you can go read them all later. Um, so great presentation, very impressive. I was wondering what your thoughts were on a fully uh, transparent data set from the supplier chain and whether it could be prohibited by certain forms of contract. There often seems to be the challenge of the schedule being used as a commercial tool, whereas the schedule submitted might not be the schedule the PMO want to present to the client, for example. Yeah, so, uh, uh, and I think it's about as the integrated leadership team of a project, you know, Highways England, our supply chain, the only way we're su successful if we're looking at the same single source of truth of the data. Um, and we definitely have a, this is data we're looking at the, inside the project. There is a, when it goes to reporting further up into Highways England and DFT, we control that data set and we control the message. But I think within the project, I don't think, I don't think there are those commercial barriers. I think a lot of them are artificial because ultimately what success looks like for both parties is on time, on budget. Yeah, but if you're a tier three or a tier four and you're getting beaten up by your sort of tier ones, is that still applicable, do you think? Or do you think they're getting over that? No, I, th I think um, part of that key learning for me is about that the collaborative behaviour and the single source of the truth of data and that sharing has to flow up and down the supply chain as well as um, yeah, it can't be Highways England and the tier ones. It has, yeah. So aggregate industries, for example, who were one of our key tier twos on the A14, ha had a seat on the the the, the project board, and yeah, we're we're all looking at the same data again. So I think you, you have it has to it has to flow down the supply chain. I agree. All right, cool. I have a question from. I doubt it, which is what process or method do you use to check the integrity of your data? And uh, yeah, I, I need help from the team on that one. One for you, Vicky, is it? Vicky or Ian, yeah, don't know. Right, we'll pass on that one then. Um, I'm trying to get myself off mute. I go for it, Vicky. Um, so I, get, I guess for us, really, it depends um, kind of what the data set is. So there'll be, you know, because it's different timings, there's different process, it depends what forum that the data is being shown at. So I guess without going into too much detail, it kind of depends on what the data is being used for in a quick, short answer. Cool. I think I think we've got a bit of work to do on that one as well. Like, so one of the reasons why the data isn't fit for purpose all the time in our businesses, as Alan's alluded to, 
people just aren't used to seeing it. Yeah. You know, it, it's only when a graph is put in front of someone important and they, they call BS on it that, that some sort of a audit is, is raised. So we need more accessibility to information and we need to be able to bridge the gra- gap between like hardcore data profiling tools like Informatica and and just providing people that actually know the right answer to things with the tools to fix problems as, as they see them. Um, so that's a good question because it's one that we haven't solved yet. And it's definitely not just Highways England that, that struggles with easy methods for, for making that happen. Cool. And for me, it's about the work stream owners, whether that's the project manager or the risk manager or the commercial manager. Have to be a, you have to make them accountable for their data in their work stream. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. you you answered the tool question for me, but from a behaviour perspective, it's if that's your work stream, that's your data, you own it, and the, don't manipulate it in a spreadsheet. You can tell me what it shows on the system. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, great culture. It's really mm. good. So I'm going to stop reading these questions out now, and I'm going to open up the floor. Um, so if you want to come off mute, please do so in a controlled manner as in not all at once. Um, and please ask those questions directly. And Valen, we've got nine minutes. I'm going to draw stumps at quarter past eight. So if anybody's got any questions, please come off mute and uh, ask the man directly. Hi, Alan. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, I was wondering um, if you're planning on engaging with the Association of Project Management on this, because you know I know there's an overall HE APM engagement. I didn't know your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, so I, I contributed to a, a, a paper, uh, I think Martin wrote with with, with APM about um, what was Highways England's d- data journey and what was my learning. So yeah, uh, Highways England is, is very closely hooked up to APM, both from a, uh, a qualification and training perspective, but from a learning perspective. So yeah, very, very, very happy to do so. And if I could build on that, so there is a data advisory group through the APM. So there's there's a few people set on that and I set on that. And Nick Small was on it from the Infrastructure Projects Authority as well. And we try and share good practice on there and try and get some things going. So this paper that Alan's referred to is in draft. It's just going through the APM process now. Um, It's about how to get started in project data analytics. So we're trying to get that through the system. It's probably going to take a couple of months and that'll be live. So Alan's made a contribution to that um, and these events as well. So are they jointly sponsored by the APM as well? So they put resources into um, uh, uh, publicising these. So we do these in collaboration with APM and the PMI uh, and the Major Projects Association gets behind it as well. So it's not just a project data analytics thing. We try and bring together data people with project delivery people. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's helped me on my learning is, is talking to other people. So talking to Gareth Parks from uh, McAlpines. He shared some of the, particularly around the, the people skills and the, uh, the data apprenticeship, which was really helpful to me to see what others are doing. So I we, I certainly don't profess to be the the, um, um, the front of all knowledge, but uh, yeah, I think it's about working across all of our communities to share that learning. Cool. Hi, right, Alex. Yeah, go for it, go on. Okay, hi Alan, thanks for such a great presentation, quite informative. Uh, my question is, um, how do you use this um, data to help manage the various changes, delays and entitlements, considering the number of um, different traits you have on the same site? Um, I think that's not an easy question to answer because every every project has a different sort of contracting format. Um, uh, but it is about um, what we're trying to do is to um, make sure we measure the baseline and measure the um, key activity. Yeah, um, our planning and scheduling dashboard is around, yeah, um, how many activities do we plan to do for the next month and how many do we actually do and how many then do we need to catch up on the next month to get us back on tra- track and things so it's um it's it's and then that's then taken with the co- commercial guys afterwards so i think it depends on what sort of contract format you've got 
Thank you so much. That's cool. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Aaron. Hey. Yeah, go for it. Hi, Aaron. Um, this might be a bit of a futuristic question, but um, with the um, data analytics and data modeling that's been gathered for that highway of England is doing with all these smart highways. Um, how does that um, interact? Because uh, how does that interact with the new autonomous self-driving vehicles that might be coming into the market within the next um, five, ten years? Ian, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd need another hour and a half on that, and we'd have to. Yeah. I think the honest answer is the role that the infrastructure provider plays in that space is still open for for debate, right? So, yeah. you know, the one thing that we know that AI or, you know, CAV needs is a is a predictable environment. So, you know, yeah. the, the better we can maintain and operate our roads, the, the easier it will be for autonomous cars to, to operate there. Over and above that, what kind of data the Googles and the Wazes and so forth the world need from us? It, it, it's it's a really good question. Like there's a lot of the stuff they already know better than we do, but there's a few things, particularly around what we're about to do to the network and when we're going to close it and that sort of thing that that is kind of privileged information to Highways England. So I think the more open data we can surface, um, you know, and, and the more real time data we can surface, the more we'll get a better idea of, of what um, OEMs need from an infrastructure provider like us. But it is by by no means uh, an, an, an answered question, that one. Cool. Yeah, and I think our learning from the A14 was effectively we spend a lot of money putting out signs to create diversion routes and putting people at risk, putting signs on carriageways when 90 percent of the traveling public use Google or Waze. Uh, uh, and how, how do we better inform the traveling public as Ian said well actually maybe it's sharing our data with directly with those people uh, and spending less on putting physical signs out yeah cool or paying for our own mobile app for example <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly Ex thank you Ian yeah yeah cool uh, uh, I think we've got time for one more question yeah so um, can you hear me uh, so we've got two there, maybe yeah. two more questions. Uh, I would call Stump. So we've got SS, I've not quite got your name. Uh, Sadaf, is it? Sadaf yep, Shah? That's, right. that's me, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. Right, question for Alan. Uh, for, first of all, thank you very much for such a great presentation, right? There was a really good learning. Um, the question is around um, on the technology side. I, I, I know you said you're not a technologist, but it would be good if you can share some of the kind of landscape, what technology you used. Was it, I've heard Power BI, so it sounds like Microsoft Stack. Was it cloud-based Azure or there were other vendors involved on the technology side, uh, like Microsoft and Google or other, are there any other vendors? Yes, yeah, so it, it's predominantly, uh, and I'll, I'll give my 100,000 book view in, and it'll probably correct me. It, it's pre predominantly leveraging our existing Microsoft suite. So it, it's Azure, Power BI um, functionality. Um, that's, that's probably the level of my understanding. And I'll let Ian uh, jump in on top of that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're cloud agnostic, so we're open to using other cloud providers. But um, yeah. Where possible at the moment, we are trying to make use of platform as a service tools from Microsoft Azure because they're they're scalable, they're easy to use, uh, and it stops us from. I mean, one of the the big problems that we're trying to fix is just the the sheer number of different solutions that have been used across the estate in our organisation. So so being able to pick a few tools that can be used for to meet the vast majority of the business problems um, has the propensity to save us a lot of money and a lot of time. So uh, data lake, data warehouse, data bricks, data factory, it's not going to fix everything, but if we can use those to, to solve the bulk of our problems, it's going to make us a much more agile, scalable organization. Cool. Uh, and I think two people jumped in last time. So I think the other person was Juzer, is it? Is it Juzer? Are you there? Uh, yes, Martin, this is Juzer here. Uh, uh, Martin, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a nice initiative, I will say, and I've been looking for such groups since long time. And uh, Alan, uh, it's a, it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, 
the industry is not standardized. Each project is different. So, you know, the data sets are not standardized. That is one of the biggest challenge that I personally feel in this part of the world, that is India and Asia Pacific region. So, uh, so what are the measures that you take uh, to standardize that data so that the future predictions and future analysis of the next project becomes easy? So, are there any SOPs that you have developed or you're uh, trying to develop an integrated tool and where the standard approach and standard methodology to input the data uh, is being followed? Cool. <laughs> I, th I think it sounds like one of your ontology questions, doesn't it, Ian? <laughs> yeah, onto ontology is the short answer. Um, we, we need, we as an industry, and it's not just Highways England, need to be able to arrive at common data definitions, common data models. Um, mm -hmm. So at the moment, a lot of the the cleansing and stuff is project specific. But in the future, we want to make sure that we're conforming to a at a minimum an organizational common data model and preferably a sectoral common data model which is something i'm trying to bend martin's ear for so yeah. that's the short answer but we could talk about that again for a long time <laughs> and okay. it's something we're looking at through the task force as well so through the uh, solutions development work stream and through the data structure work stream we are looking into this and if you want to get involved then please reach out to me and we'll pull you into that Big round of applause to um, Alan again. He's done a superb job, and to Ian, Vicky, and the rest of the team as well. Thank you.